The doctor is in. Hi guys, it's Dr. Sal from DrSecrets.com. Thank you so much for joining in. Today we're going to take a look at sebaceous cyst removal. In a previous video I explained what a sebaceous cyst is and why just popping it won't work. It just comes back to haunt you. In this video I'm going to explain to you how I remove sebaceous cysts. And in the run of a typical year I remove a lot of them because I would consider them to be a, a common problem. Um, I would consider them public enemy number two after acne when it comes to skin. So let's just uh, swoosh over here to the anatomy board. And um, here's a girl that comes in. She's complaining that there's this um, lump on the back of her neck, slowly growing for about the past year, and it irritates her. She doesn't like how it looks. Uh, she finds it miserable because it rubs rubs against her jewelry, like her necklace here, her shirt, sometimes rub on it. It's just a nuisance and a mess. So she wants to get rid of this miscreant. So let's just um, gray out the areas that aren't pertinent. So here we go. We're just going to focus on this thing here. So how do we, first of all, uh, have some idea that it's a sebaceous cyst? Like, how do we know? How are we guessing that? Well, first thing is, um, as you can clearly see, is delineated from its surroundings. It's usually almost like a perfect circle. Uh, the other thing is you may also notice that the skin here, you can appreciate it's a little bit uh, more ruddy than the surrounding tissues. That's not always the case, though. Sometimes it's perfectly skin color. Um, another method that you can use to determine if that's what it is, is um, if you look very closely, you can often see a little dimple or um, a pore in the center of it. And that's the original conduit for the oils before they became blocked. And finally, you can use your fingers and um, actually feel it. In surgery, um, we like to talk about things being soft if they're like your earlobe. The tip of your nose would be firm. So in this case, um, these things feel firm. Hard is like uh, if you tap your forehead, that's what we consider hard in surgery. So sebaceous cysts uh, feel firm. Um, they're not painful unless they're infected. So you can squeeze them, they don't hurt. Uh, the other thing that might clinch a diagnosis is uh, some people will tell you that from time to time there's a foul smelling, oily, rancid, cheesy looking material that comes up through the, the pore at, one, at some time or another. That almost invariably uh, suggests that it's a sebaceous cyst. And which is part of the reason it's called sebaceous, it's full of oil or sebum. So um, I booked her into my office to remove. This is one of these um, cases that's a minor procedure. It can be done right in my office. Uh, it doesn't have to be done under general anesthetic. You don't need an anesthetist, you don't need blah, blah, blah. It's just simple, good old fashioned, right in the office, uh, quick 10 to 30 minute procedure. So first off, we're gonna sterilize the area. There's always bacteria lurking around on your skin waiting for the opportunity to cause disease. So as we're going to be cutting through the skin here to get this um, cysto, uh, we have to sterilize it first with some alcohol. In real life, um, this is a type of surgical rubbing alcohol you would get from a pharmacy or a dispensary or Walmart or whatever. In real practice, um, we get ours in little sterry packets like how you would use for, um, I forget what we call that, hand sanitizer type deal. Or like on an airplane, those little sanitary napkins. So we get ours impregnated with alcohol. <clears throat> so I'd rub that over this area here to make a nice clean plot. And then the next stage is set for freezing. Now, nobody likes having surgery without freezing. In the old days, what I would do is give you a flask of whiskey or rum or some other hard liquor, uh, send you away, and when you're drunk and stumbling, then it bring you into the um, operating room and have my way with you. But nowadays, we have a, we're, we're much better now at um, freezing the skin in a more humane method. So here we have a picture of a syringe here, which I've filled with uh, lidocaine, which is usually my favorite go-to or xylocaine, sorry. Xylocaine is the one that I most frequently use. So um, let me just show you how I achieve the freezing. So uh, what I try to do is um, I go around, I, I make one, ins one uh, poke, say at one, one space here. So rather than going directly towards the center of the um, sebaceous cyst, I actually go kind of like in a line below it or above it. 
And the size of the needle that I'm using is the same size as you would use for um, getting an immunization, like a flu shot. So it's not that painful. And it's actually the only part of the procedure that there's any pain involved. In addition, uh, there's going to be three more shots, but it's really just the first one that um, is the icebreaker that hurts the worst. So once that freezing has gone in in this line here, well then the next step that I do is I turn the needle, you can't really see it in this picture, but I turn the needle then uh, vertically and then I go in along here, then I go in horizontally again here, and then I go in vertically along here. By that point, the, the field is basically a square patch is completely frozen and numb. Now before I start, um, some of the ways that I can tell that the skin is frozen, because obviously I don't want to start cutting and causing, causing somebody severe distress for nothing. Um, there's several ways that you can tell. One is the xylocaine that I use is also impregnated or mixed with um, something similar to adrenaline. So when I notice that the skin looks very blanched and uh, white or depigmented, then I know that that area of skin, that patch, is ready for processing. So I'm going to move this away. The next um, thing that I also do is I, I take a scissors, a surgical scissors, open it, and I use one of the prongs and jab it into the skin gently and ask the individual if they can feel anything that feels like a pinprick. If they say yes, I desist, wait, or uh, re-inject again. Typically, however, they'll tell me, no, it just they, all they can feel is like some pressure. It doesn't feel like a needle anymore, and then I know it, we're off to the races. So next step after freezing is the most fun part for a surgeon, cutting. And this is an example here of a typical scalpel that I would use, a number 10 uh, size scalpel. It's really just, um, it's really a razor blade on a stick. It's very, very sharp, uh, made of stainless steel. Very, very sharp edge. So I'll use that and I'll come across and make an incision across, as small as I can, across the, um, the cyst using the along the grain of the skin so that it uh, reopposes or closes easier when when it's time to close up the, um, the wound. So I'll show you in this graphic here this is a little stand in here for the incision. In, in real practice I would actually try to make this smaller because it's not necessary for me to open it this wide to be able to get out this size cyst. Um, after you're making the incision, then the wound opens up. So this is a little graphic here to represent uh, what you'll see. You see a bit of blood. You'll see some fatty tissue. Uh, typically, you won't see any muscle. If you're seeing muscle, you're in the wrong spot or it's not a sebaceous cyst or something's gone wrong because these things are, are uh, quite superficial. So typically, after the skin, all you see is some fat. And then as you slowly peer down with the knife going deeper and deeper, layer by layer, within a few... Um, I'll see, say half a centimeter, then you'll start seeing um, some grisly white shiny material, which is a sebaceous cyst. And I can actually show you that here in another um, graphic. Here's an example of, this is a real one that I removed recently. Uh, it came out intact. I was able to literally pop it out like a pea. And you can see here, it's a very shiny white grisly looking material. If you cut it open, then you get to the oil, which is kind of, uh, looks like, some cheese and it smells very rancid because it's been there uh, typically for over a year so it's, it's not, the mo not the most pleasant thing to smell but that also vindicates your um, opinion that it's a sebaceous cyst when you when you smell that when it hits you in the face you know that's a sebaceous cyst that you you just uh, reached okay so um, after we re remove this out Often, uh, most of the time, it doesn't come out this perfectly. Most of the time, as you're going in, you don't know exactly what level it's going to be at. So as you're cutting, most of the time, you'll nick it and it, it um, pops, it ruptures. So in real practice, um, most of the time, you have to retrieve this with little forceps and grab it piece by piece. One thing you can't appreciate on here is um, there's a, a very thin, filmy, membranous component to it on its underside. The, and uh, that is actually the root, which is what produces the sebum that causes these, um, this problem in the first place. So if you don't get the root, uh, typically within a week, uh, sorry, a year to a year and a half, um, after you finish uh, the surgery, it will grow back, it'll come back. 
So it's very important when you're, and that's the reason why just popping it at home isn't going to work because the root's still there. So uh, this is the little miscreant here. And we're going to remove that little piece of malfeasance. And now that it's out, then the next step is we put in some sutures. Whoops. So we're going to pop some sutures in. And it's all closed. Now, if you notice here, I have, um, I've used in this graphic three sutures. Sometimes I may use four or five, but tip, a lot of the time I actually can really close with just two. The reason why I add an, add an extra one to make three is for redundancy. So it's in case one of them, one of these sutures pops over the next week, it makes sure that the wound doesn't just suddenly open up again. And the reason that I don't like that as a surgeon, I want it to stay closed, is because if it opens up, then it has to fill itself back in by what we call second intention. And that creates an ugly scar. So that's why I like the edges to always be perfectly um, sealed together. So that's why I typically we'll put in one or two extra sutures just to make sure uh, for redundancy. If one pops, there's still two others to hold. All right. So that is the procedure in a nutshell. Oh, one other thing is um, with the sutures, uh, what I usually use is, um, I think is Vicryl that I use, which is a non-absorbable one. We usually divide sutures into dissolvable and non-dissolvable. The dissolvable ones, if they get wet, they start to degrade and break down. Uh, that's why I don't trust them for these wounds. Again, because I want the edges to stay right up against each other until the, the, the body is uh, finish uh, solidifying them for best results so that there's no scarring later <clears throat> and uh, the vicryl really and truly is um, it's basically a form of fishing line or nylon but um, it costs a heck of a lot more and uh, that's typical in anything to do with medicine um, the same product in any other application probably costs a lot less so um, that is the procedure in a nutshell folks and no, I'm just going to give you a little graphic to demonstrate what we were trying to achieve with all this. So this is our girl here when she came in. And this is her after the procedure. Typically within a month, uh, this is how it would look. There's almost no scarring involved. There's, if you look very carefully, you may be able to see a subtle scar. Um, but typically the results are pretty spectacular. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I remove sebaceous cysts. Thank you for watching. And uh, don't forget to subscribe so I can keep you in the loop on any new videos as I get a chance to upload them. Thanks again for watching and stay well. Thanks for watching. Get notified of new videos. Subscribe now.